second row. Yeah. So if I may, may start here, uh, please stand up, uh, mention your name and your institution. Thank you. Thank you, good morning. Uh, this is Emilio Gamarra from uh, BME Clearing in, in Spain. Um, well, first of all, thank you to all the panelists for, for your speeches. Um, I would like to ask, uh, because uh, probably in the, in the recommendations of the, of the paper of the ECB, uh, it could be uh, a very technical question. Um, I'd like to know, or I'd like to, you to highlight or, or, or uh, make a clarification about which is the curve that we are going to uh, shift, to move or to recalibrate uh, from October the 2nd with the 8.5 basis point spread. Uh, we almost know that it's the zero rate curve, but uh, some people uh, is still uh, thinking that we are going to, to move the, the par rate, the, the, the ONIA par rate. So I'd like to maybe to clarify you which is the, uh, which is the right curve that we are going to, to, move, to move, because um, probably uh, some, uh, some participants have, they have the, uh, still the, the doubt about the, the, uh, the movement that we are going to do. Thank you. Thank you. So let me start. So mm -hmm. um, basically, we have, I think in, in the report we have been laying out kind of the group of curves uh, actually that is possible to, to be used for evaluation purposes. Uh, you see that being part of that report. But actually on that particular day, what's happening is that Ionia is being recalibrated. Yeah? So uh, from my point of view, the continuation of the use of your curves that currently points towards Ionia automatically moves towards a recalibrated uh, Ionia afterwards. So that is in place already. You have that. So now at the very moment in time that you start to um, engage in con uh, um, doing asset transactions, so that's when for you now you need to actually just determine, well, what is the ester curve that I'm going to be using to perform evaluation for that particular group of products. Yeah? So, and that's when you're basically going to have, at minimum, two curves, yeah? so potentially. Yeah? So that will be linked, as we all know. Yeah? But those two curves will then be uh, kind of uh, re relevant for the individual participant. So, but uh, I think the, the, this is, therefore this is more a stepped approach. Yeah? So the Ionia curve itself that you're currently using on the first day, it is kind of due to the recalibration, it is automatically being brought in line uh, with the change that we are implementing here. Any, any, any other comments? No. Okay. Further questions? Yes, please, over here. Igor Lubisic, BNG Bank, uh, Netherlands. Thank you uh, for your time and explanation. I had one question about valuation. Uh, you talk about that some nonlinear instruments will be affected, but aren't all SOP instruments nonlinear as of now? And that because if they are quite long, uh, there is a real possibility that they're going to switch to fallback rate. So if you have to, that switch, then basically they are saying something about another rate, right? At some point in time. Yeah, I mean, we're not talking about a transition yet of, let's say, the floating rate option for a long-term interest rate swap. Yeah? So we haven't kind of touched upon that one. But uh, interest rate swaps are all, or let's say, all derivatives are being affected by the change due to the discounting curve. Yeah? So due to kind of uh, the way that, um, um, uh, that collateralization of exposure from derivatives is being implemented through CSA contracts and the use of, the of, of Ionia in these contracts uh, as a prime alignment price alignment interest as well uh, as for the construction of the discounting curve. So, and, um, and, and, and that's why all of these derivatives are affected. I do totally agree with you. Whether this is all nonlinear, I'm not sure I did, did, did get that one. So. Oh, because if you have just an ordinary swap contract, right, as mm -hmm. of now, suppose you, 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 you look at the 30 years of maturity, so basically uh, you, you, it's URIBO you six months, for example, mm -hmm. So what is actually, uh, what you're going to be exchanging? You're going to be exchanging fixed rate against your RIBOR six months at a certain period. And there is a real possibility that at a certain point in time, which we don't know, some stochastic time, T star, is going to switch to alternative rate, which we don't know. Yes. So basically that makes it quite nonlinear to me, right? <sighs> Not sure whether it's, I would describe it as nonlinear, but it's surely something that we haven't been covering in here so far. Okay. Yeah, that's for, that's for sure. Yeah. 
Yeah, so where we, I think that kind of uh, is more has become more of a topic when we talk about the creation of a fallback solution. Yeah? So for for your rival. But on the other hand, let's please keep in mind that we don't talk about the discontinuation of your rival at the moment. Yeah. So all the where, where we be basically what we'll be doing is we will be recommending a fallback rate for Uribor. We're not recommending Uribor to being discontinued in any shape or form. Let's keep that in mind. Yeah? So um, okay. that's at least kind of current stance of the, of the working group. Uribor is going to continue. There will be a fallback. And that's as far as it goes for us at, at the moment. Yeah, so. uh, yeah. OK. <laughs> not sure whether I answered your question, to be yeah, honest. But I, maybe I will ask afterwards a yeah. more detailed question. OK. Thank okay. You. Other questions over here, second row? Microphone is coming. Hi, uh, Gerald Jacob from uh, Park Fitzgerald. A uh, question for Marcus on uh, legal terminology. You'd said that uh, the fallback for you, Ionia was Esther plus a fixed 8.5 basis point spread. Is it not the case that the Ionia methodology is formally changing to Esther plus an 8.5? Big spread. So the case around fallbacks is very different. Yeah, well, uh, well I guess the question is yeah, so from me. The checker. <laughs> but anyway, uh, on next, next week, the EONIA will change the methodology to become a step plus 5.5 uh, uh, basic points. And then if you need to embed a fallback provision and a fallback rate, in, in new con in new EONIA contracts, which uh, minimize any kind of uh, value transfer uh, uh, at the cessation of the uh, of EONIA, the this fallback rate would be a, a USDR plus a 8.5 a basic points. From a legal standpoint, it's a different uh, index because one is uh, EONIA. And the other one is the Euro STR, Euro STR. So it's the same, and that's why. Uh, and, uh, and also, uh, we officially recommend it because in some, uh, in some, for example, in the ISDA mass, in the ISDA benchmark supplement, uh, it includes as a fallback rate the rate officially nominated by a working group sponsored by a central bank. So that's why we need. When you need. The working group needs to recommend any uh, uh, fallback rate uh, because this would help to apply in other master agreements uh, which the market is, is using. But it, the same is the same. Okay, we could take one final question up here in front. Paul Allen, I know this is a quick question, hopefully. You mentioned that when EONU is eventually discontinued entirely, discounting and collateral payments would go to just Esther flat, unless there's frictions. The friction you're talking about, is that just a large compensation payment for the movement of value, or were there other things you were thinking of? Yeah, it's the organization of that, yeah? So you would have kind of all your agreements in place. So first of all, with your CCPs, so mm -hmm. I think it's probably kind of easier to organize as this is usually well standardized and well organized. Um, but then you have a probably large amount of individual contracts with a large range of individual customers. Who would you have to, you have to engage with them? You would have to deal with that. So therefore, um, changing that, that, that rate, uh, that discounting or making that switch is probably just a more tedious effort. Mm. Yeah? So you, it's, 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 an, it's quite an organizational effort to go through all of that. And that's why we originally made that differentiation, basically saying we, we recommend a big bang for this, everything that is uh, for going via the, uh, the, the central counterparty platforms. But at the same time, um, we said a phased approach might be required for everything that is bilateral. And that is due to the very nature of the individual contracts and how to renegotiate that. Thanks. Okay, I'm afraid we have to close the, this very first panel. So um, thanks very much to all the panelists. We will now have a coffee break for half an hour. So we resume at 10 past 11. So, and I'm sure the panelists will be happy to answer more questions. Sure. Of course.